Hi, this is Megan Raymond with WCET. Thank you so much for joining us today. This is the Enabling Accessibility in Learning Technology webinar, and this is a joint partnership with WCET and IMS Global Learning Consortium. As we move along, if you have any questions, please enter them into the question box. We'll be sure to pull questions and get to your questions toward the end of the presentation. If by chance we don't get to all of your questions, we'll be sure to share those with the presenters and provide written responses back out to you. This webinar is being recorded and we'll send the link to you usually within one week, most of the time a little bit sooner. The PowerPoint can be accessed if you click on the handouts pane, just simply download that PDF and then you can follow along with us. The PDF and the link to the archive will be will be posted on the WCET webcast webpage. And if you are a Twitterer, be sure to follow the hashtag WCET webcast. We often get a, a pretty active back channel and you can also post your questions there. We have quite a bit of content to get through today. We'll do brief introductions. We'll talk about the myths and reality of accessibility. We'll have two institutions share their best practices and experiences with accessibility. Then we'll get to the IMS standards and have time for audience question and answer. Again, post your questions in the question box and we'll be sure to get to those. And now I'd like to pass it off to Kara Monroe, who's the Vice President for Academic Innovation and Support at Ivy Tech Community College and is also a member of the WCET Steering Committee. Please welcome Kara. Thanks so much, Megan, and I'm really excited to be here with everybody today. Good afternoon, everyone, um, and I am really excited to get started with this and turn this over to our panel. So let me introduce to you our presenters. Uh, Jane Burles vincent is the Assistant Technology Manager at the University of Michigan. Marcus Gilling is the Solutions Architect for IMS Global Learning Consortium. Brian Richwine is the Manager of UITS Assistive Technology and Accessibility Centers uh, at Indiana University down the road from me here in Indiana. And Philip Voorhees is the Technology Accessibility Coordinator at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. So uh, we appreciate everybody joining us today. And um, I just want to put a little framework around what we're going to talk about today, what our presenters are going to share with you. Um, and I think this is such a timely topic, especially as you think about uh, earlier this week in Inside Higher Ed, there was some more follow up on sort of how other institutions are reacting to sort of the Berkeley decision to pull much of their content off because of some accessibility issues. Um, but as we think about our course materials, um, they're often the linchpin of our course content. And as more of our materials move uh, into digital form, there are some unique challenges that colleges and universities um, have to consider in terms of ensuring that all of our digital, all of our course materials are accessible to all students. And so that's going to be the framework around which we're going to work today. Um, and with that, I am excited to pass the baton off to our first presenter, Jane Burles vincent uh, on the myths and realities of accessibility. Greetings, and thank you, Cara. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. So here's my agenda and three things to think about. Uh, three statements that I'm going to be discussing as to whether they or not they're myths or realities. Uh, statement number one, accessibility exists in a vacuum. Uh, statement number two, there are no good accessibility policy models. And statement number three, the minimum legal standard or uh, um, the minimum guidelines that are available equals accessibility. So let's go to the next slide and start talking about the first one. And the first one is the big myth, which is that accessibility exists in a vacuum. A lot of times people hear accessibility and they assume, well, we're only talking about changes for a small population. We don't know of any people with disabilities using our, our course materials or using our online education. Um, and, you know, this is just really going to be complicated for us. So um, we know that there may be implications down the line, but we just don't have the bandwidth to deal with this. So very often accessibility can be implemented as an afterthought if it even gets implemented at all. Next slide, please. So the big reality 
is that uh, most of those statements, uh, for the most part, are not applicable. Um, particularly that accessible design usually has broad benefits. Uh, around mobile design, for example, there is a lot of design of the hardware, of the software, that really takes its cue from things that have been part of accessible design for a long time. Uh, touch screens, for example. Touch screens have long been a great alternative to the mouse for people who cognitively were not able to understand what a mouse does. But if you're able to directly click on something, that makes things very accessible, much easier to understand. So two examples of where accessible design uh, can really uh, help everybody, and these are two of, of many, but just two that I want to quickly touch on. Number one is automatic reflow, so that if somebody needs to use magnification on a computer screen, the ability of the, the text to reflow depending on um, if the, the window is resized or if you're using a different size screen to accommodate low vision, if that's already in place, um, that's tremendously useful also for people who are using increasingly smaller and smaller screens, um, first on smartphones, then on, on wearable uh, smart watches, and so forth. Another example of this is captioning. Captioning is obviously useful to people who are deaf or hard of hearing. Um, it's useful to people who are in noisy situations. And if captioning is hardwired, in other words, if you've actually added captioning rather than relying on things like YouTube's automatic captioning, then that can also serve as made metadata. It helps you search uh, through the video much more easily so that if somebody's looking for specific information, whether or not they have a hearing disability, the captions will let them focus on the specific text that they're looking for and be that much more efficient. Next slide, please. So myth number two, um, the belief that there are no good accessibility policy models for post-secondary institutions, that the belief that every institution is going to have to start from scratch, coming up with a policy model um, that is going to do what they need it to do. Next slide, please. So the reality is that there are several good post-secondary policies out there um, that are publicly available and that are usually as a result of settlements. In other words, um, usually the National Federation of the Blind uh, will have filed a lawsuit. Now there are also lawsuits being filed um, recently uh, for Harvard and MIT around captioning. And the usual response, uh, contrary to, to Berkeley, the usual response is for there to be a settlement. And as a result of that, there are usually some very good and strong policies written. Um, University of Montana's policy is frequently cited. And I'll put in a plug. Um, I uh, myself and Brian uh, belong to a group called ITAG which is all our peers in the Big Ten institutions. And one of the things that a group of us did was to come up with a vendor guide to web accessibility. And one of the appendices of that um, does have citations of various uh, very good policies. So that's, that can be a starting point to see what other institutions have done so that you can build from there. Next slide, please. So myth number three, um, accessibility can be fully accomplished if policies address the minimum legal standard. And at this point, um, the legal standard that's usually cited would be Section 508 of the 1973 Rehabilitation Act. Um, and Section 508, uh, the first version was published um, I'm Good, I think um, at least 20 years ago. Um, so 
technology has, or close to 20 years ago, so technology has come a very long way since then. The international standard uh, sometimes set up as, as law, sometimes set up as basic technical guidance is uh, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, a WCAG uh, version 2.0 at level AA. Next slide, please. So the first reality around this is that legal requirements are always evolving. Um, Section 508, as you may have recently seen, has finally, uh, the refresh was written close to 10 years ago. It is finally being adopted as law so that the Section 508 guidelines and the WCAG guidelines will be much, much closer than they have been in the past. So instead of having two separate sets of guidelines, there will be two very similar guidelines. In addition, um, there have been concerns about WCAG, particularly that it does not always do a good job accommodating or addressing the needs of people with cognitive disabilities. So there are starting to be some attempts to, bro to broaden what WCAG does. So um, to simply say, well, we're going to rely on these standards is not sufficient because the standards are constantly evolving. Next slide, please. Um, two other realities are, first of all, that legal requirements are not always clear. Um, both WCAG and both versions of 508, for example, talk about text description of images. But built in, it doesn't always tell you how to do that effectively. So very often people will provide a text description and it certainly fulfills the requirement, but it's not necessarily going to be a text description that is going to be meaningful to a blind individual or that's going to effectively convey what's on the screen. Um, another consideration is that legal requirements don't always communicate best practices. Um, WCAG came out before the development, uh, before the full implementation, of a markup language called ARIA. And ARIA is focused on accessibility. And yes, it, it is terrific in what it does, but it's not always the best solution. And sometimes there are, there are uh, accessibility features. I see this very often, for example, with form fields. They can be better served by HTML markup, but people assume, well, ARIA exists around accessibility, therefore it's better to use ARIA. So best practices are not always communicated through the existing guidelines. Um, and for these and many other reasons, um, what, what currently exists is not always sufficient. So what I'm going to do now is turn things over to Philip and Brian to talk about their experiences in their respective institutions. Thanks so much, Jane. Um, so I'm going to pose the first question. We have four questions for Phil and Brian. Um, and I'm going to pose the first question to uh, Brian first. Uh, so, Brian, from your perspective, what do you see as being one of the biggest challenges for ensuring accessible course materials? Well, I, I think the largest challenge is, you know, how do we determine what is actually accessible? Um, so, of all the, the media content and instructional materials being used in a course, you know, the, you know, can the institution, you know, figure out if a major supplier is providing something that's accessible, or can the faculty, as they're you know they're the content expert in their course, if, if it's a requirement for them to choose accessible materials that match their content, then you know how can they determine that they're not accessibility professionals, um, they're faculty, uh, you know hopefully professional in in their subject area, um, but not you know necessarily accessibility. So there needs to be some kind of clear way that everybody in the decision chain, including even the students, can really figure out, you know, is this accessible, is this format going to work for me? Um, you know, and then we need to deal uh, with the otherwise not accessible content, you know, get that in a format that we can work with and, and convert easily 
and efficiently into a format that works for the student's particular needs. And, and Phil, for you? Um, thank you, Brian. And actually, really to extend on what Brian's saying, I'm going to say the most difficult component of this is faculty and staff development for creating accessible materials. Um, in order to begin to understand and evaluate whether materials are adopting or not, um, could be or might be towards um, at least some sort of conformance guideline, uh, it would be good for the faculty and staff to have an idea of what that means and have a program that actually helps them develop their own materials as well. We can control, of course, what we create, uh, but we can't control what we adopt, except by making a decision whether or not to adopt it. So, Philip, you started to allude to your answer to this next question, so I'll have you go first and sort of build on what you've already said, and then I'll, I'll throw it over to Brian. But how is your institution addressing this challenge right now? Um, at this point, we're developing a training course in audit and redesign life cycle. Um, basically, we're starting with the highest impact courses, highest enrollment, um, auditing, and then redeveloping through the lowest impact. And that's going to take quite a while, of course, just because of the sheer volume. Um, at the same time, all the faculty and staff uh, trained in this process uh, will create all new materials to be accessible and uh, learn a procedure to adopt accessible materials. Now, a lot of this is a conversation in, in determining um, how available those materials are, for instance, from vendors and what type of relationship needs to begin in order to move towards uh, a fully inclusive environment and helping the vendors understand that value of accessibility in the marketplace. Um, Again, as I was saying before, it is up to the faculty and our staff to understand that we control what we create. So if we provide the resources for those individuals to follow through with the training, then we have a far more effective process of beginning to address the new material development, so we'll quit creating inaccessible materials, and then through the process of highest to lowest impact, begin to remediate those which already exist. Thanks. That's it. Uh Great, a great response. And I, Brian, what else would you add to that on, in terms of what your institution is doing right now to address this challenge? Well, um, you know, I would kind of similarly echo a lot of what Philip is saying. You know, we, we provide a lot of, uh, we label it universal design um, types of training to the faculty and instructional designers. And we're working specifically even with instructional designers kind of as a, as a different capable audience, you know, assuming that if they're specifically designing online courses and we're providing a, a higher, more technical uh, level of expectation on them, and so we provide them, you know, kind of, uh, you know, training that you know, suits that audience. Um, and then, you know, in the long term, what we're trying to work with, um, last year at our institution, we accommodated over 650,000 pages of, of textbook materials. Um, you know, and we're starting to see, uh, you know, a lot of that is coming um, you know, in digital formats that are either locked down or, you know, they're custom textbooks that are chunks of a bunch of different books to where, you know, it, it's hard for us to actually get the source materials to accommodate. You know, so we're participating in groups like the IMS and others where we can reach out to the publishing industry and, and you know, work on standards that will help hopefully make, um, you know, accessibility a little bit more transparent um, so that as an institution we can understand, you know, how accessible and how usable are the, you know, instructional materials that, you know, our faculty are adopting um, and start to get a handle on, you know, where they're being used and, you know, and who can we influence to, to start making those materials born accessible. So, Brian, I, I love that uh, that comment. You know, how do we get to a, a, a system where you know content is born accessible? I'm going to steal that if you don't mind. But as I look at both of your institutions, both very large institutions at, at IU and UNLV, and certainly uh, me coming from a large institution, uh, one of the questions we always have to ask is: Is this scalable? So, Brian, I'll throw back to you. Um, uh, what is scalable right now, and, and how do we get to scale long term? Well, um, you know, part of the challenge we have is is almost a continual 30 to 40 percent increase in, in requests. So we we definitely have to get to the scalable part. Um, our budget 
um, you know, they, they would love to reduce our budget instead of watching it constantly grow. And we have more and more editing staff. So right now, I don't think the, the current process is scalable. You know, if we can start getting tools in front of faculty so that they can uh, more easily create accessible content, one of the things we're working with is, is trying to get um, some faculty piloting and making the EPUB documents, uh, making their textbooks available as accessible EPUBs. We have four faculty working on that, um, trying to, to see, you know, can we actually go right to the source of the, the instructors who are actually making uh, textbook content um, and what that would be like. Um, but really, if we can get with the major publishers, um, you know, and identify, uh, you know, what they can do for us, and that would help with the, you know, kind of stem the tide. Very good. And Philip, for you, how, how does this become scalable uh, from your perspective? Um, through my experience with the Tennessee Board of Regents in implementing this type of initiative, what I've found is as long as you have developed um, a training process and a life cycle, then the life cycle actually provides a natural scale up for your institution as well as for the system level. Um, however, you do have to have those pieces in place and the training in place in order to make this happen. And again, recognize that this is going to take a while. Um, it's not going to happen tomorrow. Very good, very good. So, um, Brian, I'll come back to you uh, to begin this, this last question we have. What is the one thing if, if there is just one thing, what's the one thing that we, could be done to meet the majority of the issues you see with ensuring course materials are accessible? <laughs> it's always tricky, the, the one thing. We have a huge okay. wish list often. Um, you know, I, I, not to the, the repeat it again, but I, I think just, you know, the transparency. If, if faculty who are adopting content could determine, you know, easily, you know, is this accessible or not, or, or, or make informed decisions about what they're adopting. Um, you know, we can teach them how to make their own materials. That's a, a part of it. But I think if, if we can help them understand the accessibility, you know, outcomes of what they're adopting, then that would be a, a pretty big dream of mine. And uh, uh, Phil, to you, Phil? Yeah, basically what I find is, is having an executive fiscal buy-in and a well-defined and available group of resources that support conduits for our content developers. Um, there's a, a certain level of development that can happen pretty straightforward with our content developers, but it, as it goes along, especially in the digital realm, we definitely need to find those support conduits that can help them along the way. And, and very often, even in, in the process of auditing and um, adopting a procurement, we need to build those procedures together, and, and sometimes this takes personnel. So. In this process, we need to have that executive fiscal buy-in to understand that there are some resources that do need to be created in order to be able to provide a really meaningful process that we can move forward and scale up with a life cycle. Great. Uh, thank you both for uh, sharing some uh, practice, uh, some real in-practice steps from what you're dealing with at your institution. I just want to remind all of our attendees that if you have questions for any of our panelists as I get ready to turn over to Marcus here, um, that we'd love for you to put those in the question panel now um, so that we can uh, continue to build a list out of those. So I'm excited to turn it over to uh, Marcus Gilling um, to talk about the IMS Global Learning Standard. Thank you, Kara, and hello, everyone. Uh, next slide, please. So IMS Global is a nonprofit member collaborative we have about 400 members, just over 80 are uh, higher ed institutions. Um, many of our members are also WCET members, uh, but we, we think that the people involved in each organization may, may be different. Um, our members are ed tech suppliers, higher ed institutions, K-12 districts, and government organizations um, working together to improve the ed tech ecosystem through standards. Uh, for interoperability and plug-and-play integration. So this image here uh, represents IMS Global's view of the EdTech ecosystem and highlights the key areas that we focus our work on. Digital curriculum, 
learning platform apps and tools, learning data and analytics, credentialing, and e-assessment. Next slide, please. And of course, accessibility is a cross-cutting concern here. It applies to all IMS's key activity areas. Um, IMS has a dedicated uh, group called the Accessibility Innovation Leadership Network, previously called the Accessibility Communities of Practice, who wrote an app note uh, last year called uh, Enhancing Accessibility Through IMS Global Standard. Um, it's linked here at this page and I do recommend that you go ahead and download it and read it, especially as, as it goes into more detail in, in many areas than, than I'll have time for here today. So the app note contains this graph called the digital ecosystem that informs accessibility. And um, one question you can ask the graph is where, where in this ecosystem do standards have applicability? And the answer is of course everywhere from the creation of content through delivery platforms onto the user system and um, possibly via interfaces to assistive technologies all the way to final consumption by the user. So standards and protocols are a very important um, factor in, in enabling an accessible ecosystem. So let's talk about some of the standards that IMS have developed in this area. Next slide, please. Access for All is a standard that uh, enables matching of any student needs with uh, digital resources that meet those needs. A variety of usage scenarios are supported, uh, including mobile devices. Um, a note in this matching process that Access for All enables between users and resources that we say any student. The fundamental tenet of the personalization paradigm is that anyone, absolutely anyone, will be in a situation temporarily or statically where they will benefit from adaption of the presentation or interaction patterns. And this is totally regardless of abilities and disabilities. Access for All, by the way, is also an international standard published by ISO IEC. Next slide, please. Another IMS specification that has implications for accessibility is Caliper Analytics. I will be uh, back one slide, please. Thank you. Um, I will talk very briefly about Caliper here. There is a link at the bottom of this slide where you can read more. But basically, the purpose of Caliper is to enable the collection and reporting of rich contextual data about learning interactions. And while the scope of course of analytics, as you probably all know, is, is generally much broader than accessibility alone, we do believe and anticipate that learning analytics in the future as it gets more broadly used uh, can be used to collect information that is, is useful for accessibility. For example, it can help identify individuals that are in need of assistance or assistive technologies. And second, it can be used to measure and evaluate the impact of any performed uh, intervention or provision of, of assistive technologies and so on. Next slide, please. So if you're interested in accessible assessments, uh, high stakes or not, you should take note of AQTI. This is a currently ongoing specification revision which aims to combine two pre-existing IMS specifications. Uh, first, QTI, which is a spec for exchange of assessment items and test content. And secondly, APIP, Accessible Portable Item Protocol, uh, which provides a test delivery interface with all the information and resources required to make uh, tests and items accessible. Another goal of AQTI is to align further with web standards such as HTML5 and ARIA to enhance the native accessibility support in assessments. 
there is a link here at the bottom of this slide to a uh, recent uh, webinar on this topic, uh, which is very informative. So if you're interested in assessments, I, I suggest you check that webinar recording out. Next slide, please. So um, what I'd like to talk a little bit more in detail about is, is the problem of accessible course materials. IMS has since 2014 uh, been collaborating with IDPF, the International Digital Publishing Forum, and W3C on a standard for accessible textbooks. Um, this work is based on EPUB, which was mentioned before. It's a general standard uh, used internationally for ebooks, uh, both trade and um, textbook publishing, and it's based on the open web platform technology stack. So it's basically uh, built on top of HTML as used on the web. The collaboration project we did here uh, was called EPUB for Education, and it's a, it's a profile, you could say, of the more general EPUB standard specifically for education, providing integration with IMS global specs such as LTI and also defining a, a baseline for accessible structure and formatting. Uh, this profile of EPUB is in use today, not as broadly as one would wish perhaps, but we, we do have uh, knowledge that, for example, publishers such as Pearson, HMH, Macmillan and Ascent Learning are, are using this already. Next slide, please. So following the work on the EPUB for Education um, profile specification, we, we realized that there was perhaps more we could do in, in terms of a uh, pragmatic stance towards enabling accessible publishing, born accessible. The question was, could we measure the accessibility of, of a given e-textbook and provide a human and machine readable report of it? If we could, this could be used uh, both for discoverability by, by users, as well as defining a concrete minimal compliance rules for entry into, say, a tender for learning content or something like that. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Did I lose you? Sorry, I'm no, having a little here, trouble Megan. here. Stand by. Oh. PowerPoint, yeah. Uh, okay, so where were we? Yes, um, the idea of um, making a concrete uh, specification for measuring and certifying accessibility of, of e-text content. So we did that, IDPF did this, uh, and the result is the EPUB 3.1 accessibility specification. Uh, which is uh, certified uh, and a final specification uh, now. So this specification defines in detail how an EPUB, EPUB book should be formatted and structured to meet accessibility criteria. It defines metadata fields so that a book can self-report, if you will, its accessibility status using uh, WCAG, AAAAA and so on. It has a lot of metadata built in um, including accessibility discovery metadata, um, such as access modes being visual, textual, auditory, etc. Um, it should be noted that publishers uh, have participated in development process of this spec, and, and it allows both for self-certification or self-measurement uh, by publishers. Um, this is important, I think, for the scalability issue that was discussed earlier as well as uh, measurement and certification by third-party specialist agencies. There is also a free 
open source software tool under development to help with the accessibility analysis of the ebooks uh, under a grant given to the DAISY Consortium by the Google Foundation. Next slide, please. Hope it works better this time. Oh yes, thanks. So another piece of the puzzle is, of course, reading systems, the apps you use to consume the content. Um, you can have a perfectly accessible book, but if the app is not accessible, it's not going to get you anywhere, right? So here's an example of a project uh, that is still running by the Book Industry Study Group, BISG, IDPF, and DAISY, which basically measures the accessibility status or features of apps, reading systems, and uh, publishes them, um, publishes both the results actually as well as the um, um, uh, tests that are actually done on, on the reading systems so that you can actually repeat the tests um, uh, freely and objectively. So we believe this is usable both by consumers as an information bank, uh, a registry of candidates for purchase, if you will. And we also believe it's it, useful for app providers since it defines a, a baseline for accessibility that they can aim for. Next slide, please. So what does this mean? Well, um, this stuff, of course, only applies to EPUB content at this time, but I, I, I like to think that this pattern is one that in the future could be used and repeated for multiple types of contents as well as apps. I think that the core principle is concretization, where you, you take a more general or abstract set of guidelines such as WCAG, you build on top of that to create a practical framework which in uh, within which the accessibility criteria for some artifact can be clearly articulated, can be measured and mass, and the results be made available. Um, and through that, we empower both institutions and end users simply by providing uh, information and the mechanism with which the information was obtained. Right? And of course, giving publishers a concrete threshold to work towards is, is good, as well as a, uh, an available tool to help uh, verify whether they succeeded uh, with the uh, adding the new features to the books. All right, final slide, please. So IMS is right now in the situation where we are trying to figure out how to continue our collaboration with IDPF, W3C, and DAISY. Uh, to further this uh, uh, goal. The um, Learning Impact Leadership Institute meeting, our annual event uh, this year in Colorado in May, contains a full track on accessibility. And one of the primary focus areas here is exactly this discussion, how we can use standards to help advance accessibility uh, based on the framework uh, established by the EPUB 3.1 accessibility spec. We will have subject matter experts there. We will have institutional and publishing representatives at the table as well. There is, by the way, also just quickly a, another accessibility related track added um, about assessments and assistive technology vendors specifically uh, to uh, improve support for uh, pronunciation by speech synthesizers. That's going to be held as well. All the information about this meeting uh, that I hope you will attend is available at imsglobal.org slash lili2017. And that's it for me. All right, very good. Thank you so much, Marcus. And thank you to all of our panelists. Um, I have a few questions, and I just remind folks, if you have additional questions, uh, please put those into the question panel, or you can also um, tweet those to us on the using the hashtag WCETWebcast. Um, and so I'm going to start, I'm going to go a little out of order here, because I think one of the questions from uh, Sandra was specifically related to the very last answer that Philip gave during the um, sections, the section on uh, putting, putting the work into action. Uh, Philip, you referenced a, a life cycle for um, 
sort of making content scalable and those sorts of things. And I'm wondering if you have any examples of this life cycle. Actually, Sandra's wondering. Um, the one thing that we did in initiating the process was first, uh, and this I'm referencing the Tennessee Board of Regents uh, initiative, is that we did an initial audit the first year we went into this. And specifically, we identified, again, um, we did this on the academic side initially, and then we moved over to the administrative side after that in the following year. But we identified, in this instance, the top 30 courses of each institution. Um, and in that instance, there were a variety of courses that were varied across our institutions. So we actually pulled together a list of the top 40 that we pulled the analytics for as far as dealing with the enrollment. Luckily, we had a centralized system that we could do that with. Um, and at that point, then we identify those top 30 courses, or should I say the institutions did, they gave us back that information. Then we worked with those institutions to develop, in this case, the faculty to initiate an audit process by beginning to understand and go through a training of how to develop accessible materials. And at that point, then we also introduced them to a survey of just measuring what their current particular course status was. And then past that, then we just initiated the process and developed a life cycle. In one instance, we found, for instance, with one of our online initiatives, that because of the volume of courses that were residing in that initiative, we wound up having right at five years worth of life cycle. And then we also initiated the best practice of review and redevelopment within that five years for that life cycle. I hope that answers the question for you. Great. Thanks so much. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and start going in order here, and I'm just going to throw this out to sort of any panelist that wants to answer it. Uh, so the first question came in from Phil. Uh, Phil's looking for some more info about when, as a state public institution, uh, when are we required to, and I apologize, I copied the question down badly, uh, into my notes. Uh, hang on just a second here. Let me grab it again. I have one job today, and I did that badly. Uh, when are we required to be compliant with the new 508 refresh rules? Um, I don't. This is Jane. I don't know that there is a date um, in place quite yet. Um, and please correct me if I'm wrong on that. Um, however, it certainly doesn't hurt to start looking at them now. And again, if you've already um, been looking at WCAG, you're going to be most of the way, if not all of the way, there. Anybody else want to add anything to that? I see a response in the uh, question in the question panel from some of our participants that they're saying January of 2018 for that implementation date. So uh, thanks to Ann and Beth and Kendra who provided mm -hmm. that date in our question panel. I could speak um, to that a little bit if you wish. Yeah, please, go ahead. Um, yes, January is correct, um, but that is for the federal government. So remember, 508 is not 504. It is not ADA. Um, it is specifically designed for the federal government. So in reality, 508 is a, is a good um, guidance tool that we can use in our 504 and ADA obligations, um, as well as a general tool to work towards accessibility. Um, so the feds are supposed to meet the January 2018 guideline. Whether we choose to or not really depends on whether or not we might have, for instance, some sort of contract with the federal government on our campus. We might be doing some sort of work for them and they have an entity on our campus. Then in that instance, that then requires us to meet that obligation. Other than that, this is a good guidance for us to follow. However, we are not specifically tied to meeting that deadline. Okay. Um, I'm going to go a little out of order just because I think Ash's question relates uh, really, really well to this. 
Uh, do you expect accessibility standards enforcement action at the federal level to continue to be strong? Um, yeah, that's the $64,000 question at this point. Um, and there's certainly multiple levels of enforcement. Um, there's the federal level, there's the state level, and personally what I'm putting my hope into is the institutional level. Um, if you, again, if you have a good policy in place where the institution is saying this is something that is important to us, we see the value of it, we see the, how this affects other things, uh, but we are committed to serving our, our students with disabilities, um, our faculty and staff with disabilities, um, that regardless of what happens at the federal level, that may be uh, may end up being our best tool. Um, I'm going to change the, there are several questions in the question panel about does federal, uh, federal financial aid, those of us that receive federal financial aid, which is probably many of us, does that obligate us? So I think I'm going to save that as part of the follow-up for us to respond to. Um, so I can go on to another sort of another question stream. Um, and this one's from Richard. Um, with the new requirements for video to have audio descriptions as well as uh, titles, um, how are the panelists dealing with legacy video? Um, that's a good question. We are starting to, at Michigan, we are starting to look at that, not, not only um, audio description, but also captioning. Um, and we are looking, starting to look at a triage. In other words, that um, for not only for, for captioning, but for our, our legacy materials across the board, that we're looking at starting with the 10 to 15 percent of what's requested most often and being proactive about that and then letting people know that uh, any other materials can be um, made accessible on demand. So that, that we have a, a finite initial goal and then a way for people to, to access the materials that are not met by that goal. And I'm going to share one of the comments that's come through in the question uh, panel. Eric from DeVry indicates that they're converting all their FLV files to MP4 streaming and captioning per course enrollment. Um, and I, I love his follow-up comment. It's all one very large perpetual project, which is how many of these things are. Are there other panelists that want to weigh in on that question about how you're dealing with legacy video? This is Brian. Um, at Indiana University, uh, one of the things we're working on is in all the different uh, platforms that serve media, um, you're making sure that we have an obvious mechanism for somebody to actually request accommodation. So, if, you know, if it's a Kaltura media player, is there a, a link available for somebody to actually click on, or if it's the live streaming system, or, or any of those types of things. So the, the ability for someone to actually request the accommodation you know, if they need it, you know, and looking towards you know, where does that model fit in, you know, and where the requested accommodation, you know, and, and inherent delays in that, you know, doesn't cause someone, you know, an inability to participate effectively. So, if it is something where it really needs, you know, live intervention um, in order to be able to, to participate, and we'll have a different standard. But if it's something out there where, um, you know, uh, it isn't live and it isn't interactive, then we're, we're currently going in and making sure that there is an obvious process um, that somebody can request it. Great. I'm going to confirm with Megan and Lindsay quickly that I've not seen any questions come through on the Twitter back channel. Um, do you both agree with that as well? I think, I think we're good to just keep moving on. Okay. All right. Then um, I'll go with the, what I think is our last question from the question panel, um, and it's from Andy. Uh, which is, and I think this is sort of a good general sort of summary question for everybody. 
Um, what is the responsibility or expectation uh, for instructional designers? And I, panelists, I'll let you sort of change that to sort of anyone else at the institution um, in regards to accessibility. How do, you, how do you lay out those responsibility and expectation matrices at your institutions? At Indiana University, when we're working with instructional designers, we're kind of tasking them with looking at the content they're using um, and how easily it could be accommodated. So if somebody comes into the course with specific needs that would need accommodation, can it be done in a timely way? We've, we're looking at that and given the realities that students with disabilities frequently will enroll in the first or even second week of, of a course. You know, they have the ability, just like any other student, to drop ad and, and do other kinds of things. So what we're looking at a lot of times is proactively captioning the first couple weeks of a course um, and then leaving the rest of it uncaptioned um, or maybe with just kind of mechanical captions in the background that could be easily edited, you know, depending on the material. Um, but doing what we can to make sure that there actually is a process in place um, and defining who is responsible and um, what resources are there that if a need comes up that we can accommodate it in the time frame that you know is necessary. We have another question from Sauter that sort of goes down a different path, which I think is a good one to address here. Has there been any faculty union demands or MOAs in response to the accessibility requirement? Anybody have experience with that? Um, I'm not aware of any at Michigan. Um, what, what I see much more of actually is that we do have faculty and staff members here with disabilities and we are in touch with them as well. Um, they, they, as, as compared to the students, the faculty and staff are much more likely to complain and bring to our attention if there is something um, that they are finding to be inaccessible. Um, so that has, has been more of our experience. And uh, Kristen has a couple of really great questions here that I want to try to get to. Um, based on the current lawsuits, do you see the beginnings of a much needed shift to be more proactive in terms of more universal design? Um, when we're talking about current lawsuits, were we talking about since 2010? Um, yes. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. Kristen. Okay. Yeah, most definitely. Um, accessibility, as was mentioned earlier, or should we say conformance to guidelines, can get you only so far. And um, universal design really helps uh, flesh out that, that process. Plus, the nice thing about universal design is where accessibility very often is built on the concept of providing some sort of adaption to your environment. Um, in reality, we need to shift our mindset from adaption to providing access to everybody, um, no matter their ability. And so when, when we begin to keep that piece in our mind, um, the accessibility just becomes one one leg on a table, and then there's many other legs that actually support it. Uh, so I think that the universal design is some of the efforts that, for instance, CAST has put out um, really help us move in the direction of changing our mindset from um, accommodating to uh, accessibility than past accessibility to true usability. Uh, and I would say that, of course, you know, the guidance that have come out with the different lawsuits um, have specifically talked about substantial equivalent ease of use. It's given us a good definition of accessibility and as well has identified some particular guidelines to build off of. But I've noticed that those are guidelines to build off of. Those aren't the minimum guidelines that will protect the institution fully. This is uh, Marcus. I can comment on, on that as well. Um, 
And I've, I've seen the exact same tendencies as, as Philip speaks to, uh, in, in my case, primarily within the publishing world where I worked uh, for, for a long time. Um, the idea, uh, say, five or ten years ago of, of providing one electronic book that looks and feels beautiful for anyone uh, was, was quite foreign, right? Uh, but now we, we see an increased tendency among publishers to really want to, to do that. Uh, one artifact, one book that can adapt to to disabilities and uh, you know temporal circumstances uh, and, and all that stuff, right? So it's certainly a a trend, I'd, and I don't know how much of it has to do with lawsuits. Of you know, another aspect that triggered this, I think, was the advent of mobile, right? Suddenly, people realized that reading a PDF on a mobile is is uh, sometimes pure tortured, um, right? And so people started looking for this idea of, of adaptability and flexibility of, of the content. So I think there are several factors that have played in to create this movement towards uh, universal design. Um, we have a, a couple of sort of specific questions from Crystal and Vandana. So I'm going to pose both of these at the same time and, and see if the panelists uh, can address those. Uh, Crystal's question, there's some debate about closed captioning with WCAG AA versus text version. Can someone speak to the use of closed captioning versus the text version in best practice legal terms? Uh, the standards lead to a gray area, but expectations seem to be closed caption focused. And then Vandana's question is, if a YouTube video which has auto-generated closed caption and the content is optional, i.e. it's additional resources, does that meet the accessibility needs? So a couple of those more specific questions. Where would you uh, suggest that they suggest folks go for answers to questions like that. Wow. Well, if, if there's an issue with uh, WCAG's uh, advice in this area or a disharmony with, um, with other specifications, then I, I would turn to W3C. Um, which are the owners of that specification and are working very hard for now as they've done for decades to make sure that that spec is uh, as good as can possibly be. So I, I would go to the source and, and discuss it with, with those people. And I would just, I would add in from our own institution uh, here at Ivy Tech that we do, ex we do involve uh, both internal and external legal counsel quite a bit. Um, on reviewing these types of specifications. So you most likely have a legal counsel in your institution that may be a good place to go for questions like that. I'm going to close with one final question uh, before I turn it back over to Ma Megan for the sort of wrap up. How do educational resources fit into the accessibility conversation? Is there anybody who wants to take that one? Um, could, you, could you, I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Could you clarify that a bit? Veronica, is there something more specific you'd like to know about that? Um, I, she just says open. So I, I think my interpretation of the question would be when sort of anyone can contribute to it and adapt on it, you know, who owns the responsibility for um, the for providing accessibility to it? That's a, a debate we have in our office quite often. Yeah, I think that's an ongoing debate, um, and and I think ultimately the answer is is increasing overall awareness. I mean, it's there's not necessarily a one size fits all answer to that, but if people are, one of the things that I often say here is that you know there there are all kinds of overarching concerns when somebody goes to develop a an application or adopt an ebook um, you know you're worried about security you're worried about price you're worried about you know a variety of things accessibility and universal design should just naturally be part of that 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 everybody takes responsibility for so I know that's not necessarily a satisfactory answer, but that's the ideal. 
is an ongoing ongoing battle. Megan, mm -hmm. I know you've been uh, going through those slides for us quickly there at the end. I'll turn it back over to you to wrap us up today. I just want to thank everybody for attending. Wonderful. Thank you to all of our panelists and Kara for adeptly moderating wonderful, wonderful questions. I know there were several we didn't have a chance to get to. We'll be sure to get responses back out to you as soon as possible. Thank you, Marcus, Philip, Kara, and Brian. This was a wonderful presentation and I hope you all found tremendous value in it as well. It was recorded and we will post that on the WCET website and you'll also get a link through GoToWebinar. Thanks again. Thank you.